Good evening. I'm Christy Max Williams, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the October edition of this, the 21st year of the Arts Cafe Mystic. Thank you. Thank you. We are grateful to you for joining us on this autumn evening in this season of mists and mellow fruitfulness as Keats so, ah, somebody knows her Keats. On this season, perhaps of electoral fog and stinky baloney, as my mother would put it, as we march toward the next election. And it occurs to me, it occurs to me that we might actually not all reside on the same political page. <laughs> Indeed, you and I might disagree on some important points. Well, for cracking ice, as my father would say. That's not exactly how he would put it. But for tonight, let's agree that brilliant poetry and music trump any politics. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> In any case, for those of you new to the Arts Cafe, and I know there aren't many of you, in addition to the foolishness you've already endured, our mission is to present to you the nation's most celebrated poets and writers, along with New England's finest musicians, in programs that lift your spirits as they deepen your mind. And if we have a little fun along the way, so much the better. Before we get started, I must insist that you remove your cell phones from your pocket or purse? Oh yes, you'll be the one whose ring will sound loudest if you don't. And holding it before you, that's right, just like that, bitterly, roundly curse it for the tyranny it exercises over your life. <laughs> At very least, switch it off for the duration of the show. So let's get on with it. Our opening voice tonight is the Connecticut-based poet, Victoria T. Murphy. Or at least for tonight, she's based in Connecticut. But tomorrow, she'll be celebrating her birthday with her family in New Hampshire. Though, in fact, she's from New York City. We're all from somewhere where she earned a PhD from the City University of New York and taught at Hunter College, among others. But it's Ms. Murphy's poems that start our program tonight. She brings with her a delightful debut book of poems called In Defense of Worms. Her defense for the lowly worms being as a fly fisher's bait. And if you know anything about fly fishing, you know that it's both the craftiest and most challenging means of piscine predation. Stay with me. <laughs> Just as poetry is the craftiest and most challenging of literary forms. I'm counting on your indulgence tonight. <clears throat> But what's special about Ms. Murphy's poems is how they use the craft of poetic form, meter, and rhyme to make verses that are once witty and wise. Ms. Murphy came honestly by the crafts of her poetry and fishing, it seems, by way of her remarkable family, and perhaps we'll hear more of that. At the Arts Cafe, we are too rarely treated to the pleasures of light Verse, precisely because such poetry demands an all too rare blend of intelligence, humor, and command of verse. But tonight, in defense of worms, I invite you to permit yourselves such a treat and join me in welcoming Victoria T. Murphy. <clears throat>
Thank you very much, Christy, for that artful introduction. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you all for being here as well. I've been looking forward to this occasion. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Rewards. I wrote it when I was taking a course at the Hartford Seminary on uh, what the great religions teach about poverty. I think I was supposed to write a term paper, <laughs> but this is what I wrote instead. <laughs> Rewards. Blessed the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Their lot on earth seems desperate, but God, we are told, hears their prayers. The rich never make it to heaven. The eye of the needle's too small. When they die after profligate living, it is hell that will welcome them all. <laughs> Such endings are quite hard to picture. Is heaven all sweetness and light? And is hell a cauldron of fury, burning in endless night? Perhaps when we die, we will travel to a place in the median zone, where everyone's status is equal and poverty is unknown. None will have more than the others. We'll all do moderately well. To the poor, it will seem like heaven, but to the rich, like hell. <laughs> My next poem is not perhaps so very light, but um, it was inspired by the Robert Hayden poem, Those Sunday Mornings, which many of you probably know, a beautiful poem, in which he describes his father getting up early Sunday morning to stoke the furnace to warm the house. And I was struck when I first read the poem about the parallel with my own experience uh, of my father also getting up early in the morning to stoke the furnace, but Robert Hayden was an African-American and poor, and I was neither of those. The chronic angers of that house, which is a line from the Hayden poem. Vacation mornings in the wintertime when we were at our country place, I'd wake to hear my father swearing at his task. He'd gone down cellar in the still cold house to stir up last night's coals. And when they glowed, he'd throw three noisy logs on top of them, then turn the many dampers right or left so that the heat would rise and warm our rooms. My mother found the ancient system quaint and liked the country smell of burning wood, so kept the log-fed furnace when she bought the hundred-year-old farmhouse and the land. Nestled beneath two blankets and a quilt, I'd roll the flanges open on the register by reaching out a bare toe from my bed so that my room would slowly fill with warmth while sounds of acrimony mingled with the heat. It's smoking, Charlie, came my mother's voice from where she stood outside my sister's room, resounding faintly from the flue as well, while adding in her tone, without the words, this happens every morning, needlessly. Why can't you ever get the thing to work? would echo up the flu. I know it's smoking. And then there'd be more crashes, more bad words, and all our rooms would fill with blue wood smoke. <laughs> a, a scent that brings my father back today, along with whiffs of cigarettes and booze, that heavy mixture of his rage and shame. But then we'd hear the fire start to roar and know the smoke was drawing where it should. My father, coughing, slowly climbed upstairs. I'd lie in bed until the room warmed up. Later we'd joke, my sister, brother, I, would imitate our father. And then we'd laugh, as if our silliness could somehow dampen all those morning fires. And now, leaping forward from the early years of my life, to later on down the trail. The next poem is called Summer Villanelle, and I'm sure I don't have to tell you that a villanelle is a form that requires a certain pattern of repetition, so when you hear the same line over again, it's not that I couldn't think of anything else to say. <laughs> it's that it, the form requires it. Summer Villanelle. Breakfast with grandchildren I've come to dread. 
their parents' deafening solicitude, while Granny tries to leave her thoughts unsaid. Will you have milk or orange juice, toast or bread? The moms and dads interrogate their brood. Such dithering with grandchildren I dread. <laughs> Which sippy cup do you prefer, the red? The answer, naturally, is often rude, and I try hard to leave my thoughts unsaid. <laughs> there were no questions in my day. Instead, one ate one's meal in silent gratitude. Our grandmothers inspired us with dread. Our offspring, too, were reasonably fed while grown-ups talked about ideas, not food, and only children left their thoughts unsaid. Now, with their choice of fare unlimited, these kids eat nothing, and I thus conclude that future meals with grandchildren I'll dread, although I've learned to leave these thoughts unsaid. <laughs> A footnote on that, my son, who is an English teacher, and I thought would think that poem was pretty good, uh, is also, however, the father of three small children. He, he read this unsmiling, and after a pause said, just because you leave your thoughts unsaid, Granny, doesn't mean that everyone doesn't know exactly what you're thinking. <laughs> And while I'm reading a repetitive verse, I will read you a pantoum that has an even stricter pattern of repetition. Um, this pantoum happens to just have one rhyme in it, which is not required of a pantoum. It just happened. I don't know quite how. It's called Old Bow, B-E-A-U. Old Bow, a pantoum. Oh, how I wish I'd washed my hair. But how could I know he'd be standing there? Fifty years later, it's silly to care. Why didn't I find something else to wear? And how could I know he'd be standing there looking as always so debonair? Why didn't I find something else to wear? And now he sees me and starts to stare, and looking as, as always so debonair, he's crossing the room with deliberate air. Does everyone see us? Does everyone stare? Does everyone realize we had an affair? He's crossing the room with deliberate air and hesitant smile I'd know anywhere. Does everyone realize we had an affair? And does he still cherish the past that we share? With that hesitant smile I'd know anywhere, he greets me with grace, but I'm all too aware that he doesn't remember a thing that we share. <laughs> Men never look back. It's very unfair. He greets me with grace, but I'm all too aware that 50 years later, it's silly to care. Man never looked back. It's very unfair, but still, I wish I'd washed my hair. <laughs> the next poem is a sonnet based on my favorite Bible story, which is about Martha and Mary. Remember, their brother asked Jesus to come to, uh, to dinner. I think you'll probably be able to tell which sister I identify with. It's called Martha Copes with Yet Another Unexpected Guest. <laughs> no one ever thinks to tell me anything. The other day, my brother brought a guest to dinner unannounced when I expressed vexation, having not been marketing. So all we had were leftovers. He said his friend, the rabbi, wouldn't mind. So I, as usual, was forced to cope and try to make a meal from curds and old dry bread. While Sister Mary, holier than thou, pretended not to hear me banging pans, but gazed upon the rabbi in a pious trance. Rabbi, said I, make Mary help me now. And then, so easy for a man to say, he told me, Martha, do not cook, just pray. <laughs> As one gets older, one is subjected to more and more tests to see if one is still actually functioning. And I... <laughs> 
I uh, had to have something called a carotid ultrasound once, which finds out whether there's any blood going to your brain. And <laughs> it was uh, a remarkable experience because of the noise that the machine made, which was recording what was going on here. Who knew that the blood to my brain sounds like the ocean, like the sea on a pebbled beach, like waves under the keel? All my life, these elegant rhythms have played unheard in my head, like the clouds of snow geese in New Mexico, every dawn rising together, deserting their ponds, surging up in the cold early air to fly north to the cornfields, returning at twilight, white wings in the dusk, thousands of feathery forms falling out of the sky to alight in the shallows once more, whether or not we are watching. Well, I realized when Christy was introducing me that I don't actually have any fishing, I hadn't included any fishing poems, so in place of the next one, I will read the title poem, um, if I can find it, of, the, of my book, In Defense of Worms. Um, and of course, it isn't in there, I'm sorry. In defense of worms, I grew up in um, spending summers in a part of New Hampshire that uh, my cousin, who's very kindly here tonight, knows as well or better than I do. Very beautiful part of the world. And my older brother and I, early on, got interested in fishing, which our parents were not interested in. And we discovered that if you tied a worm to a hook, if you could find a hook somewhere, and tied that to a string and dropped it in the brook, you could often catch a trout, usually about this long. <laughs> it wasn't until much later that I married a fly fisherman and learned how to uh, fish with an artificial fly. In defense of worms, the angler and the angle worm were once related, as the term suggests. Not now. Most anglers squirm when urged to skewer the wiggly worm. The artificial fly, they say, is what we anglers use today. The worm is totally passe and irks the ASPCA. But you'll agree who've toiled to dig in muddy soil for worms that zig and zag away. Only a prig would say the worm is infradig. And finally, uh, I'm going to read, I guess, what I could call my signature poem. Uh, some several decades ago, somebody rather unknown uh, coined the phrase Murphy's Law, and those of us whose name actually was Murphy did not appreciate this. Um, <laughs> as I'm sure you know, Murphy's Law says that if anything can go wrong, it will. And some of us felt this had been specifically aimed at individuals in our family. <laughs> so I wrote Murphy's Law Improved. This time of year, and it is this time of year, this time of year it seems, the squirrel desires to end his life squashed flat beneath your tires. He dashes out just as you're driving by. It seems inevitable he will die. But when you wince, imagining the thwack, and in the mirror glance with horror back, there is no corpse. How did that squirrel contrive against all chances somehow to survive? Remember to be thankful for a lot. So many things that might go wrong do not. <laughs> Thank you. Victoria T. Murphy, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm pleased to announce that we have Victoria's debut volume in defense of worms on sale tonight. As always, all proceeds go to the author. This gives me a chance to thank our friends at Bank Square Books for their support. 
Mystic is lucky to have so hip and friendly an independent bookstore. I also want to thank the Mystic Arts Center for welcoming the Arts Cafe again. Our community is fortunate to have such a resource, and we are grateful to feel at home here. So, on with the show. For tonight's musical interlude, we're delighted to welcome back the remarkable singer-songwriter Lara Herskovich. There are some artists for whom the journey by which they came to their calling is both interesting and useful information. Lara Herskovich is one such artist. After enduring the usual enforced piano lessons and composing the obligatory adolescent songs, love songs of course, she had the good sense to get into law school and the even better sense not to go. <laughs> Instead, she ventured into volunteer social work, then the real thing, doing graduate work in macro policy and planning, which led to a career with Save the Children, doing community development, education, juvenile justice, that included posts in Africa, Asia, and Central America. While abroad, she, made, she picked up that most portable of songwriting instruments, the guitar. And it was then that she began to compose songs of a sort that would stick. And then that she began to conceive of music as a career. Several pages later in the story, Lara Herskovich has issued five acclaimed albums, toured from Miami to Maine and appeared prominently on NPR's Prairie Home Companion and most recently on Where We Live. She has been Connecticut State Troubadour, has done gigs at CBGB's and The Bitter End in New York. As you will see, she is a songwriter of conscience as well as heart and is, as you will hear, she has one hell of a voice. And yes, you are right that we are lucky to be getting such a talent. So won't you please join me in welcoming Lara Herskovich. Are there any questions so far? Just checking. You never know. You know, there I always have I'm so happy to be back here, Christy. Thank you for inviting me back to this wonderful gallery and center and cafe. I always have, I must admit, this is now I think my third time here, and I have like a slight bit of anxiety getting, like choosing garments for this particular location. Because Christopher Greenleaf, who's also doing a wonderful job on sound, also is a fantastic photographer. And we're in an art gallery, so I'm always very aware when I get all these terrific high resolution photos from him, that whatever is behind me, you know, is either going to match or really not at all going to match. So. so this is an OK one tonight. I did all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Except, like, I don't know if, what that is. It's, I mean, it's art, so it could be lots of different things. But I'm imagining a photograph that has my head being, like, attacked by this thing. <laughs> From there, it's like the perfect angle. So, are there any questions now? piece of artwork that I would like to purchase has already already has a red dot on it. So I'm going to bring it up here and talk to whoever one of you already put a red dot on it. It's the middle of the morning, the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, I-95. this 
steering wheel better than they wanted to. It's the price they pay for being able to stay a couple hours with you. If you want to sin, you got to learn to get by. You gotta learn to drive. La 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 la, yeah. Sometimes I feel like Cinderella, dreaming of the ball. In state to state, I sit and wait to sign my name on the green room wall. Imagining a white horse drawn carriage, I'd follow its headlights and program the GPS to make it by midnight. If you wanna sing, you gotta learn to survive. You gotta learn to. I keep time and try to turn towards the green lights, green lights. And I'll stop to watch the first star appear as if to show the others how. Absolutely nowhere else I would rather be right now. If you wanna sing, you gotta learn to thrive. You gotta learn to drive. La 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 la, yeah. Thank you so much. I um, want to play a few songs from my most recent recording we were just talking about. Is it still an album? I think it is. It's complicated, but... <sighs> Do you have enough guitar out there? I see one person sitting next to this person. On average, we're doing all right then. I think that is what that means. Mm. I want to play a few songs for you from my most recent recording called Four Wise Monkeys that's all woven in and around themes relating to the prison industrial complex in the United States of America. So when I'm not doing this, I work uh, four days a week for, on behalf of kids in the Connecticut's juvenile justice system to try to keep them out for a private not-for-profit public policy and advocacy organization that's working to keep them out. And as part of that work, we do a lot of visits to facilities where they're kept, that are locked, which is also known as prison in some cases. 
And some of them are fantastic and offering wonderful programs that are giving them what they need to heal and grow and learn and thrive. And I so relate to all of these kids. Because when I was their age, I was doing a lot of the same things. And I got caught sometimes. And I don't like to talk about, you know, they let me go. I don't really like to talk about the details because I'm not a lawyer, as Christy already told you, and I don't know the statute of limitations. I'm like, could be bad. But all it would have taken for me to end up in deep into the adult criminal justice system, I have no doubt, had I been a young man of color when I got caught doing the things that I got caught doing, and plenty of things that I didn't get caught doing, I would have ended up. So I wrote this song about, in this particular case, young women who end up in facilities, <clears throat> but also so sort of about them and for them. It's called Time. Trouble and me were like gravity. So much time back then, long and winding, beautiful dead ends, wondering if the future's around the bend, wondering if a future was around the bend. The moon is wrapped in a razor wire, but it will rise and someday so will I. Me and patience never did get along. But I'm trying to be strong. Now I follow guards and commands Nine times fallen, ten times stand Nine times fallen, ten times stand Leaning toward a sunrise Whispered to the wind Which one will set me free? Thank you. Thank you very much.
and this seems like a fitting one to play in an art gallery and an art center because it was inspired by visual artists down in Birmingham, Alabama. number six digits long never imagined you'd have to be so strong counted the hours till you could leave the place all they ever noticed were your mistakes something written on a building you tried to see but no one ever told you it was a possibility and painted on the overpass you prayed it told the truth this is what it looks like when someone believes in you it said you it said say but you get to raise yourself at the end of the day so packed up your courage and left the rest started walking and hoping for the best like a flower through the pavement you found your way to free staring at the sidewalk you finally agree this graffiti and what it guarantees you thank some stranger for helping you to see that you you pray to what you know what you show and what you try to hide look inside look inside look inside of you Thank you very much. I'm going to play one more in that kind of series um, and that theme. <clears throat> so as we think about incarceration in America, it affects not only the person that's behind bars, but his or her entire family. And for those of you who don't know, this is really our civil, one of our civil and human rights crises we have. Uh, for those of you who have seen me play before, you've heard me say this before, but the United States has 5% of the world's population. We're pretty small population-wise, and we have a full 25%, a full one-quarter of the world's prisoners. We're locking each other up for all kinds of things that people do not belong behind bars for. And uh, not surprisingly, without services and things that anyone might need with addiction and things like that, we don't come back out any healthier. So this one is more about how it affects the family. Last thing I remember, you said play or be played. Tomorrow can't always be the better day. 
I can't sing a love song Cause you can't sing along Guess I'm gonna have to find another way I'm getting better at living alone And trying not to turn to stone Like you're not coming back someday. I thought you should know we almost had a little girl. Wonder if her hair would have looked like mine. Wonder if she'd bottle up everything like you do. I would have called her Clementine. I wonder if she would have liked your tattoo and Riding roller coasters like you do And if this little family would have got us through But she's lost and gone forever now like you So many things I wish I could forget so many tears I couldn't make you shed Some things are better left unsaid And this letter is better left unread Too many ghosts in these sheets No matter how I Try. I can't get them to say goodbye Gonna get a new zip code Flap my wings and hope for flight Wish I could get between those bars tonight So many things I wish I could forget So many tears I couldn't make you shed some things are better left unsaid And this letter is better left unread Thank you. Thank you. So now that you have some idea who you are dealing with, I want to play you a brand new song. And this, is, this goes out to someone in, up in the Boston area who I do not know, haven't met him. He, um, he runs a folk music blog of some kind. And I was about to, I was preparing to play a show up in Boston with my friend Beth DeSombre, and she submitted the information to the blog so that the Boston Universe would know about our show, etc. And he got the information from her and said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to list, bless you, the information for that show because Herskovich, that's me, is not folk enough. And so I wrote him this song. <laughs> if I were a folk singer, I'd write a lot of songs. Anybody have any questions? I'd stand armed with my guitar and ask you to sing along. Please sing along. My topics would be people, poverty, and such. But you'd still glare and declare not folk enough. And I would sweetly and lovingly reply to, let me look around, are there any children here? And we're taping this for like cable access. I think this is gonna be okay. Christy, I'm sorry in advance if it's not. And I would sweetly and lovingly reply, folk you, folk you, who made you judge and jury to folk you, folk you. 
and that high horse you rode in on to. Now we all have a right to our opinion, I believe. And I can see you would trim my limb right off the family tree. Plus thousands more writers you would not allow. We preach love and peace, but I'm not feeling peaceful now. Help me sing, here we go. So folk you, folk you nice. Who made you judge and jury too? Folk you, feels good, right? Folk you, and that high horse you rode in on to. You guys are quick. See, did I mention it's a brand new song? Uh, here we go. All right. Now, I am not an expert. This much I know is true. And yes, I will confess to using some jazz, pop, and blues. But if you ask me, folk music's greatest sin is leaving the front door open so we can all come in. So we gathered the best minds in American folk music at the Mystic Arts Center, and we took a vote, trying to figure out what to do about you, and we decided you can be folk too. Yeah, even you. Because we suppose that's what Woody would do. He'd say you can be folk too, even you. And so can that high horse you rode in on to. So can that high horse you rode in on to. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to I'm going to leave you with this one and if we're going to um you know there are a bunch of old friends here if there's anything in particular you wanted me to close with now is your time because I forgot to ask you that before. Um but I um really just want to thank so much Christy Williams for organizing and all the volunteers and Christopher Greenleaf and how about a big round of applause for Arts Cafe Mystic? Really? Wow. Was that like a noise of disappointment over there? What, what just happened? I, I missed that. No? The different song? Because I could do like a medley. I could do like a 60 minute medley and maybe Christy wouldn't notice. <laughs> Mississippi Lullaby. Wow. Okay. And if. Um, there was something else you wanted to hear. I think you should celebrate by buying another CD. It makes no sense at all, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for being such a great audience and for supporting independent poetry and music here in the shoreline of Connecticut. You won't see a stoplight or a grocery store, the kind of town leaves you wanting more it might have to say goodbye no bottom to the bottom line can't afford to sing a Mississippi lullaby the mayor got an offer he could not refuse now if you need work, you get to choose Behind the walls, inside, or at the uniform supply So you can sing a Mississippi lullaby mm, One part blessing and five parts disguise One part truth and five parts lie. It's a perfect factory for things no one needs. But people here have mouths to feed. 
children doing time after time after time get in line to sing a mississippi lullaby we're all in line to sing a mississippi lullaby Thank you so much. Thank you. Laura Herskovich, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Laura. As we ready for intermission, I would invite you to add your name to our mailing list at our book sales desk. You'll also find their albums by Laura Herskovich for sale, including the aforementioned Four Wise Monkeys. I own two editions, two copies of this. I'll give you one if you come by tomorrow. Um, also, we'll have books for sale by Victoria Murphy. And if you'd like to get the advanced copy of Margaret Gibson's, what's the name of your book? <laughs> Broken Cup, ladies and gentlemen. OK, we'll take five and come back. Thank you. The Arts Cafe has been privileged to present to you so many great poets, winners of the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Award, the MacArthur Genius thing. <laughs> and we've taken great pride in introducing you to these acclaimed poets. But we take special pride and pleasure in introducing tonight's featured poet. Margaret Gibson lives among us in Preston, Connecticut, though she was born, raised, and educated in Virginia. She came north to teach at Yukon, but she stayed because her muse flourished here and because here she met the love of her life. In the course of a distinguished career, Margaret Gibson has established herself as one of our foremost poets. Each of her 11 previous books has been an event in the poetry world as she kept her way steadfastly on a mission to voice poetry in prayer, praise, and celebration of the mystery and majesty of life. Ms. Gibson has brought to her mission the gifts of a clear musical voice, a rock contour's talent for telling the story well, and a seemingly inchoate empathy that's enabled her to connect the human day to day with the cycles of nature. Not surprisingly, Ms. Gibson's books have garnered many honors, including the Lamont Poetry Prize, the Melville Kane Prize, and two Pushcart Prizes. Her masterwork, The Vigil, a poem in four voices, was a finalist for the National Book Award, and five of her books have been nominated for the Pulitzer. But she has just published a book called Broken Cup that changes everything. When I learned that Broken Cup concerns Ms. Gibson's husband, the poet David McCain, and his dementia resulting from Alzheimer's, and when I was invited to read the manuscript of the book, I said to myself, no good deed goes unpunished. Frankly, I feared reading Broken Cup. What a wonderful book of poems. A brave book. A wonderful love story, really. A love story that's important and astonishing because it reports from the front lines of one of life's transformative misfortunes. And because the beautiful and miraculously unsentimental poems of Broken Cup find humor, joy, and ultimately grace in loving what is broken. 
This is why Margaret Gibson's Broken Cup is a book for our times. This is no doubt why Garrison Keillor has read a couple of the poems on NPR's Writer's Almanac. But tonight, we are privileged to hear the first public reading of Broken Cup by the poet herself. So won't you please join me in welcoming Margaret Gibson. Thank you, Christy. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I don't think I've ever uh, read, even though I've read here before, I don't think I've ever read to an audience um, uh, where I recognize so many faces. This actually makes it scarier. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank you all for being here. And um, I want to um, begin by reading a little passage, a short passage rather, from uh, David's memoir, Spellbound, Growing Up in God's Country. Um, I like to begin the reading or end the reading with um, words of his. Um, he, his mother, Ida McCain, spent a little while here in the Mystic Manor nursing home when her Alzheimer's was diagnosed. Um, and I'm going to read just a short passage um, from the beginning of Spellbound. Um, the passage begins uh, describing two other companions who are waltzing down the hall with Ida. A handsome woman, Beth, is in her late 60s, about my mother's age. She wears scuffed brown oxfords and a pleated Pendleton skirt under her nightgown. She has the husky voice of a woman who once enjoyed whiskey sours and cigarettes. She might have sailed at one time, played golf or tennis. Tall and graceful, Miss Doubleday might, must be close to 80. She holds the hem of her house coat as though crossing a stage, her arm extended and bent slightly at the elbow, her wrist upturned. She is beautiful with the bones of a sparrow. My mother looks like a retired school marm from the Allegheny Mountains. With a permanent, with, without a permanent, her hair is combed straight back over her ears like an Indian, her face drawn and haggard like that of an old woman staring vacantly into a WPA camera, Appalachian Still Life, 1937. There is a sadness and strength in her face, lacking in the other women. The CAT scans show a sinking of the cerebral cortex, a kind of saddleback in the middle of her brain. I call the declivity on the x-ray the valley of her life. She might enjoy that. The image puts her up on the ridge top, surveying God's country. When I look at her, I think of myself. The odds are one out of five that one day I'll lose my mind as well. The odds are slightly better in Russian roulette, one out of six. It's nearly a family tradition. Wearing only a housecoat, my mother's mother waltzed downtown in the moonlight to gather flowers, just as my mother did. I remember mother crying when at three in the morning the police brought grandma back, tears for herself. She shook her head. In a few years, I'm going to be just like grandma. You mark my words. Her words are marked. But most everything else she ever said or knew is filed away in the snarled circuitry of her brain, deep in the base of the nucleus of what the doctors call the neurofibrillary tangle. So even though there was warning, um, of course, we never really expected um, it to happen to us. Um, and I say us because Alzheimer's is very much um, something that affects everyone who knows or loves um, the person who has it. Um, I'm going to not spare you at all. I'm going to take you right in at the top with a long poem that actually begins the book. 
um, call sentences. I've just read you some of David's sentences, and here's a poem in which I'm writing long lines and also playing on different senses of that word, sentences. Um, and the poem is called Sentences and Assay to David. I have a friend who thinks it's terrible there are no answers. He doesn't believe in God because God would be an answer one could know, and we don't know. I say he believes without knowing he believes. He scoffs at that, and I think to myself, the root of believe is to hold dear, therefore to live with caring. I admit I'm stretching the root, but my friend lives as if he's taken Pascal's wager. He paints stroke by stroke. He wagers. He creates a world. Theoretical physicists believe there are six flavors of quarks. Their names are up, down, strange, charm, bottom, and top. They believe this. They eat breakfast. They go for walks inside the landscape of an electron. But you, my beloved, who forget that you forget, and who make beautiful sense of the world, would dismiss such cogitations. You would focus on the sheer joy of one breath, this one breath. Part two. If I identify with what stays, I am one thing. If with what flows, another. I am a river in disguise. A river knows that place and wants are not fathomed, plumbed, or tallied. When I stand at the edge of Main Brook and watch the snow melt sweeping around the prow of stone upright in the cascading torrents, I am of one mind. When I straighten up, having lifted and lightly balanced mossy stones to make a cairn, I am of one mind. When I bow before the tree, whose roots slide over a shoulder of granite jutting out of the earth, whose roots hold the stone steady, flowing past it and embracing the stone, disappearing into the dark source that makes all words one, I am of no mind. Is it so terrible not to have answers? Three, I grant you it is terrible to lose one's mind. As burst of light by burst of light, the neurons mis misfire, unable to reach across synapses, making run-on sentences, eroded fragments, tangles. In the metaphor of eclipse, the mind is shadowed. No ricochet of radiant protons graces its surface. Where did you grow up, you ask me? My story, you knew it once. Yours, too. Now you read your memoir more moved than when you wrote it. The story's fresh, immediate, your depth of feeling no longer held in check by intellect. You read the sentences, your lifelines, amazed. Is it in your DNA, perhaps, a coded sentence? You will, like your mother before you, be asked to let go of all you hold dear. Our friend picks up his paintbrush. You put down your pen. Think of Sisyphus, condemned to accomplish nothing, sentenced to toil uphill to that resting place where the stone crests and settles, tilts and tumbles down. What is his mind at that moment? I keep wanting you to tell me what you remember, what you know and do not know, as the stone rolls, as the river flows, as the root sinks deeper, as is its way out of sight. Eclipsed, the moon goes dark, but the moon is still there, a deep presence held in place, disguised as an eddy in the river. These metaphors, I believe, up, down, 
strange, charm, bottom, and top, hums the chorus in the background as Oedipus, that beautiful man, snow-haired at Colonus, said, says openly, all is well. And you, who were memory's scribe, this is now what you say. I have been lucky. I've been lucky all my life. Um, this is a poem called Heaven. Um, we had a, got our, our dog, the Golden Doodle, whom Rick Coster has now made famous. Um, uh, in 2009, and, and weather much like we've been having this week. Um, we were outside doing autumn things with the dog, heaven. The leaves are turning one by one, carried away in the crisp wind. In one letter he penned, Coleridge turned away, calling love a local anguish he meant to leave behind him. Away, away says the blue and gold day, and no one hears it but the wind, whose law it echoes. The dog has a red ball to chase. You pick up a flat, perfect stone for the wall you hope to live long enough to rebuild. I prune briars, pick burrs from the dog's fur. I teach come and sit, sit here, a longer sit beneath the cedars. The grass is freshly cut, sun low, all the energy of a summer's day rushing into bulb and root. The dog runs off, returns, the stones balance steeply. Good work, good dog, this is heaven. Sit, stay. We all want things to stay, sometimes we want that. Um, the uh, wisdom that's been guiding my life in the last few years has been um, something Ramakrishna said, which is, um, let what comes come, let what goes go, find out what remains. Um, and writing this, these poems was, in, in a way, um, an exercise in doing those, trying to do those three things. Um, we used to call David the, um, or in fact I still do, the house docent. Um, he would love to take people around the house showing him paintings and various odd things that he'd picked up in one antique store or another or yard sale. He was always good for a deal uh, and he had a good eye. Um, and as his Alzheimer's, uh, you know, came on and, and actually all the way through during the period when he was at home, he would start rearranging things. Um, which drove me crazy. Um, here's the poem, Revising. This man who loves things, he's moving things from here to there in the house, but not randomly, no, no. He moves things to their rightful places, and he has a motive and a cue for action. For example, two paintings shifted from separate rooms where they've hung for years now share a common wall in the library where the setting sun strikes their gold leaf frames. Corn shocks in a field, a loaded hay wagon, a farmer with his pitchfork, now hung below an Anglican formal silt knotted and embroidered rendering of an open coffin, the bare body, absent perspective, about to spill out of the box but it doesn't, held in place, no doubt, by the upright bishops. Behold the man, they seem to say, behold the corn god who died for our sins. They're both about harvest, David insists. But can't we just let things be, I cry, because too much is changing, too much is forgotten, misplaced, because I want each thing to stay where I left it, where I want it, where I know it, keeping vigil over our rife impermanence, because these things will live longer than we will, because he will forget their names and ours, because he will die and I will. Just tell me why you keep moving things, the words hardly out of my mouth, and I get it. The house is his poem, 
The poem is his life. He's revising, as I will, this poem, hitching one sound to the next, shifting this image nearer that one, coupling just this moment in the dusty cupboard, he's juxtaposed the flawless Mesoamerican bowl and the Japanese bird whose beak I banged off by accident. His mother's teapot restored next to a bowl he bought right off the potluck table because he wanted the image of the Fisher King swinging his ankles, whistling in the quiet of his heart. Isn't it all about the heart? About accident, appetite, repair, and original paint, about rupture and relishing wounded flesh and the joy of returning home moment by moment, trying to know the place and the two of us who live here, seeing into our true nature as if for the first time. You know, people say the darndest things, and um, someone asked me once, uh, are you prepared for the day David won't remember your name? Well, I mean, no, <laughs> of course not. Um, but loss of memory for all sorts of things and, and um, language being one of them is, is, of course, one of the hallmarks of the, of the losses that, that continue and continue. Um, in this poem, Rosemary, um, the, the, the poem begins with me being a little bit of a show-off poet, thinking up different words for spring, and um, moves on um, more into the issue at hand, which is of forgetting. Rosemary. Bud Pierce, Sun Talon, Blood Briar. Spring insists on renaming itself. Are you prepared for the day he won't know your name? And I might have answered, Lord of milk and suck, Lord of straddle these thighs, what is my name compared to the 10,000 unspoken, solemn or spangled names of God? And I might have answered, I've forgotten how to prepare. I've forgotten how to pray. But I am learning now to retrieve stray wordlings that shake loose from his sentences. Chalice and shovel, hold me, buried root. And to say them as a rosary is said, or a mantram. And perhaps I can also pray with the cutting of rosemary I scissored from a clay pot on a sill of the sun. Smell this, I say, stroking his shoulders and his neck with an arabesque of its green fragrance. Smell this. Who cares what we call it? Um, This poem, Tasks, uh, comes with a, an epigraph from a Sufi teacher who will remain anonymous because I don't know who he is, <laughs> but I know he's a Sufi teacher, uh, who said, the task of a human being is to transform suffering into joy. Tasks. And along the way, there's housework. Forget the computer the checkbook, the inscrutable repair of whatever overheats or squeaks or ices over. Never mind the wooden lamp post, rotten, fallen on its face like a corpse in the wet grass, which needs to be cut. Your allotted jobs are to dust, fold the laundry, tasks in which you take such unsung pleasure, I'm abashed. I'm sorting cutlery. I'm Job in a bathrobe, wondering where, oh, where in the wrong drawer you put it. We'll make a good wife of you yet. I nearly joke, but look at you. So happy, I bite my tongue. <laughs> Do you ever hear something in your mind and pretend you didn't hear it and then later wish you had so you wouldn't have had to live it through in another way? Oh, you know that. All right. Yeah. You know, this one's called enactment. A 
a bit of climbing vine copied in silver and cleverly linked, that was the tie that bound me, the cord about my wrist, the shackle. I couldn't work the catch, nor explain to you how to do it, though I tried. You went for pliers, the wrong tool. All the while, my voice, a rising crescendo, my eyes wild, complaint and imprecation, and deep within me an image of the gats, the self-immolation of pious widows, and I've been good. I don't deserve this. Why, why, why? And you, standing by, wanting to help, you could only blame yourself. Incompetent. That's when I calmed down and the bracelet snapped open and fell into the sink, into the abyss of yesterday's whisper, far back in the mind, barely audible, trapped. <clears throat> Losing it. What little I know I hold more dear now that I take the daily reinvention of loss as my teacher. I will never graduate from this college whose MA translates master of absence with the subtext in the imperative, misplace anything. If there's anything I want, it's that more people I love join the search party. You were the one renowned among friends for your luck in retrieving from the wayside a perfect bowl for the kitchen, a hand-carved deer, a pencil-drawn portrait of a young girl whose brimming innocence still makes me ache. Now the daily litany of losses goes like this. Do you have your wallet, keys, glasses, gloves, giraffe? Oh dear, I forgot my giraffe. That's the preferred response, but no, it's usually the glasses, the gloves, the wallet, the keys I've hidden. And when I get frantic, when I've lost my composure, my nerve, my compassion, I have only what little I know to save me. Here's what I know. It's not absence I fear, but anonymity. I remember taking a deep breath, stopped in my tracks. I'd been looking for an important document I had myself misplaced. High and low, no luck yet. I was beside myself, so they may indeed have been my double running the search party. Stop, you said gently. I'll go get Margaret. She'll know where it is. <laughs> but I'm Margaret, I gasped. No, no. You held out before me a copy of one of my books, pointing to the author's photograph. You know her, you said. We looked into each other's eyes a long time. The earth tilted on its axis, and what we were looking for, each other and ourselves, took the tilt, and we slid into each other's arms, holding on for dear life, holding on. Um, I'm going to read you one poem. I'm going to preface this with a disclaimer. I always tell my, I used to tell my students no disclaimers, but here I'm going to do it. Um, I, there is in the back of this book um, an acknowledgement of gratitude to so many people who um, came over when David was um, still at home and helped out and were really there for both of us. Um, but then there are other people. Yeah. <laughs> so this poem is called Like Ice. What is it about some people? As I'm leaving his house after a convivial visit, my host, an old friend, stares at his shoes and mutters, I can't see much good ahead. Is he Cassandra or yesterday's news? Does he mean to be saying he'll help out? or opt out. There's always good, I reply, meaning the sooner the better. However one defines or would embody the sublime, it would be better if it arrived pronto. 
Before David, intent on a mission he's forgotten, wanders off into the woods. Before he shivers to see daylight wane and an undefined darkness slur along the window glass. Before I'm so glad means I just do as I'm told. You think you have it bad, another friend quipped too quickly, then pulled herself up short, and you do. I don't recall what she said next. With practice, one can simply watch as an agony like ice in warm liquid dissolves without altering the level in the glass. As I um, said to Rick and he, uh, Coster, and he put this in the interview that was in the paper um, today, um, there's, there, there are lots of ways in the beginning um, to be involved in denial, um, to be far-hearted. Um, it's fear, you just fear of not being able, thinking you're not gonna be able to handle things. David didn't, had participated in denial in his way and I did too in a way. But that has to be broken through at a certain point. Um, and I think that's, although I didn't put it to myself that way when I was writing this poem, the title poem, Broken Cup, which I'm gonna read to you now. Um, I think that breaking through um, uh, and being able to um, love what is broken um, is, is, is key. It has been for me. Um, I don't think there's anything that's mysterious here. Broken cup. I've forgotten how it broke. The great cause or the petty cause that cracked the handle in two pieces and left me without a cup for morning coffee. In the cabinet there were others of white porcelain with steep, elegant lines, cups that matched their saucers. But my cup was Mexican, squat, and as round as Rivera's peasant bent, built excuse me, bent before the wall of callas he carried on his back, his burden of blossoms. Hand-painted, my cup was carnival purple and yellow, flowers that honored earth, birth, death, geometry, symmetry, riot, good sex, good coffee, the sun rising hot. I banished it, broken to my desk, and used it for paper clips. Now I've rescued it, fit and glued the pieces back together, Still, I'm afraid to lift it, even to wash it by hand in hot water. It is that fragile. You brought the cup to me from Puerto Vallarta, that seaside trip to, you took to help your daughter past heartbreak. A little hotel by the sea with bougainvillea and a great deal on cocktails as the sun rolled its dying splendor onto the Pacific. I think I was jealous. I was jealous. I hoped you drank margaritas and missed me most likely Dos Equis with a squirt, a squirt of lime. The cup gave me Mexico each morning on the cheap. I loved it. I loved it. It broke. I ignored it. I cast it aside. Sounds like a classic sitcom bad marriage. Sounds like the wary caregiver who reads the 36-hour day heart empty. Who really wants to know about this despair? I have minimizing friends who tell me it's not so bad, just a little accelerated forgetting, such as we all have these days. Oh, ancient of days, that was once a name for God, for something so deep within the self, it's beyond us. Even so, it is possible, I want to tell them, to love what is broken. Possible, urgent, and necessary. And so for love of thee and me, I take my broken cup and set it down before me on a yellow placemat. I make toast with ginger jam and real butter, coffee whose beans have flourished on a mountain in, in Peru, I hope near Machu Picchu. I sit down in my Japanese bathrobe, in my Navajo beads with bare feet. I sit without ire or envy, without fear or despair, and drink and eat, slowly very slowly, savoring all I can remember of that first night we met, the good talk, 
the dancing until we were too tired to do anything else but take the dancing to bed, the miracle of unintended meeting, moments I hope to remember when I lie down to die, my beautiful love, your head of unruly hair and unruly thoughts unraveling into a silence that will lengthen or may break off as this handle did in two pieces. Who knows how love will hold or if we will ever be all right? Who knows what wrong tastes like or how much emptiness the cup will hold as we share it? Who knows? And if it is the cup of suffering, drink it down. Or better, may it pass from you and you live easy and go gently where you will or where you must. I'll go with you, grateful for plum-colored flowers so close to bruising, coffee, sunlight, earth, the journeys we took together and the long one left us to walk until we lie down near clear water, shade trees, green pasture. In that place, there will be nothing unspoken, nothing forgotten or feared. It will be day or night, whatever the hour, it will be all shining, our whole and broken bodies full of light. I don't think this one's going to need any explanation at all. It's called bed. Well, we're not 16 anymore, I say softly. Funny you should say that. And you began talking memory as if we were, in fact, 16, mistaking me for some distant virginal mist rising off female skin like fog off a lake. I didn't know you then, I reply. I'm your wife now, remember? <laughs> Happy also to be your mistress, if you like. We're laughing now, under the covers, your face near my thighs. You come up for air, a conspirator. Margaret likes that, too. <laughs> Making love takes longer. We make reservations as if for dinner out, afternoons for delight, bed, or sofa. Well, isn't the body a space-time event? Isn't it a river or the color of the ridge seen through winter woods at four when sun spills gold on it, then russet and purple, dun and dusk? Your skin, you murmur, soft, here, feel, so beautiful, it's so beautiful. Here and now, snow falling outside, and we're warm inside each other. Have we ever done this before? <laughs> yeah. How are you doing out there? <laughs> okay. Right. Um, it's a poem called um, Happiness. Um, David loves the Dalai Lama. In fact, there is in his uh, room at Chestnut Cottage now in Westerly a picture of me, a picture of Josh and Megan, and a picture of the Dalai Lama, whom he calls the big guy. Um, happiness. An art, not a right. Happiness, according to the Dalai Lama, David reads aloud to me, this is some years back, is not as elused as one might think, but closer and grisp. I wonder if his screwing up how words are said is prologue to a deeper detour in the neuronal relays, or is it faulty eyesight as he speeds over the lines of small print? Now he looks out the window at a steady drizzle. He smiles and calls it the seep and slur of rain. 
He enjoys punching out the stressed syllables as he returns to reading. A measure of personal happiness. Happiness, our purpose in life. Not selfish, as one might suppose, although the wish to avoid unhappiness may be. And I remember a friend's sad report. He put his urine-soaked underpants on my face one night as I slept. She told me this serenely, as if the experience she had with her husband's dementia would be mine. There was no stopping it. I said nothing, only fixed my mind on the remembered smell of David's skin. Something like saffron married to a whiff of ripe pears and worn out cotton undershirts. Blindfolded, I could distinguish David and find him in a crowd of men where I allowed to snuffle each man's neck and smell the difference. And that thought gave me happiness. As unexpected as was the glimpse of the road that moved beneath us as we sped home on a morning long ago, after a night of reading each other's poems aloud, every blessed one of them, the road beneath us seen through the rotting out, porous floor of the old Jeep, we traveled at the speed of light, and nothing, nothing could slow us down or keep us separate from each other or the road wherever it took us. Where's Christy? I'm, I'm going to read, I'm going to read one more poem. Um, it's a long one, longer one. Um, it has David's words in it, which is why I'm going to read it, I think. Or I haven't read this one before anywhere. It's a little hard to read because um, I've folded some words from his poems into my lines. Um, so when it's David, I will just lift my hand like that so you'll know. And um, the poem is called Respect. <clears throat> Naturally rough hewn a scrawled uplift of splayed shade, broken branches big as ship's timbers. This wolf tree sentinel just behind the tumble down west stone wall. This mix of living and dying both at once, it's my angel of history. Doesn't respect mean look again? Pay attention, you used to caution your children, your students, and me. So is that why, mute this morning, you stare out the window at the wolf tree, down at your hands, now outside of the tree, as sun and shadow model stone and wood? I don't understand why I'm like this, you say. Your hair is silver gray, but I take your hand like a child's, and we sit down on the yellow sofa and settle the cushions. You trace the splay of small bones on the back of my hand as I talk about the forgetting, how invisible it is. Had you a broken leg or a brace, you'd know, I said. You'll, you'd see it plain. What tangles and knots, what misfires and seeps away, who sees that? Who sees that, I repeat. And slowly something shifts. A dead weight falls away. Respite, I think, as the light returns to your eyes from somewhere inner. You're clear, the way you used to be. Clear. He wrote, we're these wild-eyed centers of perception. He wrote, we're a phylum of night thoughts and summer fantasies. He wrote, I learned to listen to silence until it fills with snow. And if he walked alone, steep hills and ridges, happy in the solace of roots like the tendons of a human foot, learning the patience of small animals, staying out of sight, lingering in the shadows, that doesn't mean he approved of the withdrawal suggested by these lines. He wanted to rid himself of idealism, learn humility, join in, even if freedom and justice might bring to others the trouble we call help. 
I read his scrawled notes in the margins of his poems to see how he argued with himself, how nothing was easy. He wrote, in a future dynasty of wealth and injustice, when the Chinese again become poets, they will read of our lives in time capsules and speak of the rich professionals of America with oriental inscrutability and awe. How, they will wonder, did so many men of uncommon circumstance slide so easily into the ancient trap of spiritual depravity? They will wonder that a land of such surfeit had no curiosity, knew nothing of history. When he wrote, inevitably, I'm Chinese, did he mean he was ready to write inside the walls of a lean-to, a full moon flooding the window? He just built his own house in the woods and was living in snow, believing in brush strokes, once again embracing a life of outskirts and simplicity, living with a great respect for mystery and the pleasures of getting lost. Now, when he hears Odetta on the bows saying, sometimes I feel like a motherless child, sometimes I feel... It's himself, a choir boy in Bradford, that spiritual, his solo, that solo, his lament for his mother whom suffered and whom he couldn't help. In my favorite poem of his, he's in a dream at a banquet and he rises, rises and anchors on a chandelier looking down at faces for a reason why. From his perch, he reads a broadside as the waiter below him pass and serve, rocking like ships or shadows. He begins in the middle, saying, Listen, whenever you must die or choose to fight someone else's war, never wear an initial or a pen, a uniform. Learn to fly instead. Shape your mouth like wind and push your breath to call whoop, 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 whoop. And in the poem, these words crack and hatch into birds that fly above everyone's head, floating in slow motion, floating out to sea. I had dreamed of freedom. The waiters disappeared. The servants vanished. And so he sounded his barbaric whoop. He was my Whitman, my Thoreau, my Li Po, and Po Chui. He loved William Blake who pointed to children at play, whooping with laughter, and said one word, heaven. He loved what hands and heart could make together. Driving home, he'd shift gears with his knee, his right arm around me. He wouldn't let go. He tied trout flies, sought the right curve of blueberry branch to carve into a bird, gardened, <laughs> taught whoever would listen. In each of his gestures or broken sentences, now I sense memories that nest in the heart more than shadow play. They're real, if inaccessible. Taking words from his poems, weaving them inside my own, what is this if not another way of making love? He's given us a body of work in which to find him. I go there, it's another world, and I listen. He said, I like to think of things far off. I like to speak of good and evil. He said, I refuse to count my losses. He said, right here, right now, earth steams, birds fly north. Okay, I lied. I'm going to read one more, but it's short. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm reading it um, because Josh and Megan are here, um, and um, they're in the poem. Or they are, their father talks about them in the poem. The poem is called Simple. God's joy, wrote Rumi, moves from unmarked box to unmarked box. I remember my sister's husband, after her stroke, complaining, Liz is a box. It says on the outside, Liz, but she's not there, not the Liz I married. 
Is she simple, our daughter wondered, noting how the sheer weight of loss had rendered my sister speechless. But I have to confess, as I watch your memory fade, grief and the rest of it aside, I'm also curious. What is the self? What of the self or of the no self outstays loss after loss? I watch the wind fill with leaves, red and gold, as the tree that was once a summery billow thins to an outline. A friend told of a woman he knew with dementia, and who are you, someone asked her pointedly, and she replied, I watch. How is it for you? Our son got up his courage and asked you, hesitant, not wanting to offend. I forget this and that, you replied, but it doesn't bother me. I love Margaret and you and your sister. That's what I remember. It's that simple. Red and gold, the leaves dance in the air. The tree empties, the air shines. Love moves from unmarked box to unmarked box. Margaret Gibson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Margaret, and thanks also to Laura Herskovich and Victoria Murphy. For those of you who would like to take Broken Cup home with you tonight, I'm delighted to say we just got a fresh shipment in within the last few minutes. I'm deadly serious. Margaret would be delighted to sign it for you. Don't forget that the Arts Cafe will return in November with Sue Ellen Thompson. And remember, the Arts Cafe is a tribute to you. This is community, my friends, and doesn't it feel good? Thank you. Good night. <laughs>